Hi, I'm Tom Payton, director and publisher at Trinity University Press. Thanks for joining us for the Maverick Book Club. As a nonprofit, cultural and educational publisher, we are committed to an evolving agenda of work that engages, questions, and brings us together as a community in effective and productive ways. Tonight's discussion revolves around how we look at and think about Texas, mainly small town Texas. We are joined by photographer Peter Brown and journalist Joe Holly, authors of Hometown Texas, moderated by a good friend of Trinity University Press, Robert Rivard. Bob is a veteran journalist, author, and civic leader, former editor and vice president of the San Antonio Express News. Many years ago, he and his wife, Monica, founded the Rivard Report. Now the San Antonio Report, this online publication chronicles and impacts life in San Antonio in ways that are seen and unseen. Bob is the author of the book, Trail of Feathers, and has contributed to numerous other books. So enjoy yourself. And at the end, don't forget to check out the book we'll all be reading and talking about next month, Marfa Garden, The Wonders of Dry Desert Plants, with authors Jim Martinez, Mary Lou Saxon, Jim Thistle, and Martha Hughes, moderated by Rainer Judd. All books are available to you at a special discount using the link and promo code shown in the discussion tonight or visit us online at tupress.org to discover other books and events as well. Thanks for joining us and welcome to Bob who will introduce Peter and Joe. Thank you, Tom, good evening. And thank you, Bergen Streetman, who's behind the curtain here, but really making the show run. And welcome one and all from the Maverick Book Club. It's great to be with all of you this evening. I hope you're as excited as I am about the next hour that we're gonna spend with Joe Holly and Peter Brown talking about Hometown Texas, which I can tell you is a wonderful book front to back um, from the uh, Ivanhoe uh, State Bank on the front, where I can promise you I don't have an account, uh, all the way to the end of uh, the East Texan section. Uh, I'm going to introduce each of them briefly, and then we'll get into a conversation, and um, all of you can join that conversation. There's a chat room and there's also a Q&A. It would be easier for me if you put your questions uh, and your names in the Q&A section and we won't wait until the end of the program. I'll try to work those in as we go along and make sure that you're part of the conversation. Uh, special privilege for me to introduce both of these guys. Um, Joe Holly has been the native Texan columnist for the Houston Chronicle since 2013. He's a native Texan himself. I guess you have to be to pull off a column with that title. <clears throat> but I, I've known uh, Joe, he like me has been an itinerant journalist with many great stops along the, the way in his career, editorial page writer in San Diego, uh, longtime contributor to Texas Monthly in its heyday, uh, a speech writer for Governor Ann Richards, not incidentally, a staff writer for the Washington Post, and uh, an editorial writer from, for the uh, Chronicle in Houston from 2012 to 2017, when he was a Pulitzer Prize finalist for his work on gun control in Texas gun culture. But I also had the privilege of hiring Joe when I was the editor at the Express News. And um, of all the work that he wrote there, what, a, a series that proved to be so prescient and has served as the foundation for so much journalism that others who have followed in his steps of doing was a series called The Texas Hill Country, Loving It to Death. And uh, it was about um, the unregulated and uh, frankly um, accelerating uh, development of the Texas Hill Country. And it's somehow apropos to mention that because this book, Hometown Texas, captures a Texas that we all love and cherish. And um, one of the things we want to talk about is how fast it's disappearing or how enduring it is uh, tonight. Joe's joined by Peter Brown. He's a noted photographer in Texas and well beyond our borders. Uh, he's photographed the open landscape and small towns of the High Plains for 30 years. Lives with his wife, uh, Joe Fryer, in Houston. Joe, by the way, lives in Austin with his wife, Laura Tolley, another um, noted journalist. Uh, Peter often collaborates with writers. He's the author of Seasons of Light uh, with Denise uh, Levertov on the Plains with Kathleen Norris, West of Last Chance with Kent Haruf, and Habitier Lequest with John Brinkerhoff, uh, Jackson, and of course, Hometown. And I want to say one of the books, uh, of the six books that Joe has published that I think 
is of special interest to those of you in the Maverick Book Club is the um, is uh, God's Guns in Small Towns, uh, God Guns in Small Texas Towns. That was published uh, just last year, uh, explores the aftermath of the mass shooting at the Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs, just south of us here in San Antonio that had such an impact on everyone here. Well, Joe and Peter, welcome. Congratulations on publication of Hometown Texas. Thank you, Bob. It's an incredible book. And one of the things I have said to you both that I really enjoyed about it, Peter, is that the photographs don't directly illustrate the columns Joe wrote. They're their own storytelling in their own right. And the two um, really uh, work as a collaborative uh, effort visually and textually together. It's a kind of a ballet dance from one end of Texas to the other. And uh, I, I'm curious before we get into the book, how did the book happen? How did you guys get together and decide to take this on and, and, and turn it into a book? Peter and I met in Houston. I, I, I read your columns and, and absolutely loved them. And I wrote you a fan letter and you said, well, I'm thinking of doing a book. You want to do a book? And I thought about it for about, you know, 20 minutes. And yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I think we're doing sort of the same thing. I'm taking pictures of what you're writing about and it probably would work out. And lo and behold, it did. And as soon as I saw Peter's photos, I realized that he had a sense of the state that complemented what I was trying to do with the column. And, and Bob, as you say, that they, they don't illustrate the columns, but, but they offer a unique perspective that complements what I try to do with the column. And Peter, you're, you, you kind of have one foot in the world of what I would call uh, photojournalism, but really uh, photography is art. And, and in fact, your works have been collected everywhere from, from uh, New York and MoMA to, to uh, the Manila in Houston and the Houston uh, Museum of Modern Art. I mean, you, the, the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, you're in the big spots. I mean, your, your work's been collected everywhere, which is uh, makes you much more than a Texas photographer in terms of how I would describe you. Um, and um, these photos are very evocative photos. Thank you. Um, I was once described as a Yankee gone out west and come down south by a computer student. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, but I've, I've lived in Texas no longer than I've lived uh, anywhere else. And, and I have had, had a few photojournalistic assignments. I mean, one of the, one of the few was, has been with Joe, where we, uh, we went to a little town of Fayetteville, which ended up in the, in the book, um, and photographed a, a little general store there. Um, but I'm, my work really has been more involved with the art world. I mean, I, I, my great kind of mentor and hero is Walker Evans, and he spoke of a, a lyric documentary. Um, so I think of myself as a documentary photographer, but within kind of the context of a personal vision rather than simply dealing with the facts. So the, 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 the work kind of, there's a narrative that I'm trying to establish in the sequence of images that I, I put in the book. And, and Bob, Bob, you might ask you or else I will, what is it that he sees when he looks at that camera and, and realizes this is what I want? Are you asking me that? Yeah, that's a question. <laughs> It, I mean, that's the most remarkable thing. I mean, you're always, I, I begin my introduction actually in, in the book talking about just that, that you're struck by something and you're not exactly sure what it is. And um, then you, you begin to kind of, kind of fuss it out a little bit and, and figure out where you should be and, um, you know, what the image should, uh, should contain. And, and then you put your, you know, this is a big camera. You put your camera down and where you put it, of course, is very important. And the movements with a view camera, which I use, can change the image as well. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a really wonderful kind of a dialogue, interior dialogue between a rational mind and a purely set, you know, wonderful set of intuitions that this is a, this is a photograph. And, you know, I know that, that um, it's what I want. And then you click the, click the shutter. And then you go back and, you know, six weeks later, when, you, when you, you're going through a whole series of proof sheets or whatever they happen to be, you realize that um, you probably made more mistakes than you have had successes. And um, editing, editing, editing is what photography uh, is about. Editing the world, editing your work, and then editing, you know, for a show or a book. Bergen, can you go backwards one slide to the Michoacana Cafe? Uh, <laughs> I took my wife there on a long rambling uh, 
uh, road trip. That's in Perryton, I believe. Is that correct? And um, I told her everybody comes here. It was kind of a bad joke because we were in a town we didn't recognize and it was the only place we could find to eat. <laughs> I first got your book and I came to this photo. I raced upstairs to <clears throat> excuse me, her home office and said, I told you everybody eats here when they're in Perryton. Here, here, that's here. not Bob standing out there, right? <laughs> here, here, uh, that's uh, Pastor Martinez, I think. Anyway, I, I, I was immediately struck. I mean, you come around the corner and there's this incredible, you know, yellow and blue building set up <laughs> against those, you know, wonderful, wonderful um, elevators. Um, and I needed something else uh, in the picture. And so I went in and asked the owner if, <laughs> if he wanted to be in the photograph. And he said, no, no, no. Uh, but, you know, Pastor rose, raised his hand. He was a you know, at back in the kitchen and came out and luckily he was wearing a, you know, red apron. So it all, it all kind of worked out. You know, Cartier-Bresson talked about the moment and capturing the moment. Uh, Peter, when you go into a town like Perryton that we're looking at, or uh, we saw the moon rise over West Texas there, do you know ahead of time, I'm, I'm in the hunt for a certain photograph today and I know what it is. And when I see it, I'm going to get it. And, or does it happen more spontaneously. It's it's really I'm 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 wide open and then again I write about this a little bit in the, in the introduction. I'm both as focused as I can possibly be and then as wide open as I can can be as well. It's just it's odd odd business of of you know you're just kind of ferreting out these uh, these moments and then and then you can capture them and and you can uh, keep them. And it's just, that's what is so exciting about it. You, you never know exactly what you're going to get. I mean, at the end of a book, if I'm working on something on, on, on the high plane, say, and I need just for kind of documentary purposes, entrances to towns and what, what these wonderful signs happen to say. And I'm coming into Turkey, Texas, and with Bob Wills and Turkey, and there's a turkey and Bob Wills and a guitar. And, and, and yes, that's just exactly what I need you know, for this particular part of the book. So I will look for, for specific things, um, but I'm always open to, you know, whatever, whatever confronts me. And that's, that's what I most enjoy about photography. Just, you never know what you're going to get. Joe, you and Laura divide your time between Austin, where you principally live and, and uh, Marathon out in West Texas. People are always interested in the process of how, how you, a, a book gets written and produced. And so this, this started out as columns. Are you at home in Austin and decide I'm going to head to, you know, uh, Fredericksburg today and write a column? And and do you hop into a car and it's all road miles? How does this work? That's pretty much the way it is. I, I would like to be several columns ahead, but for some reason I can't seem to do that. And and so I either read about something like the the Mason Courthouse burning, or a reader tells me something that sounds interesting or I, you know, I just, I remember something from my past or something I've read and I'll get in the car and, and, and go. Let me talk about Mason for just a minute. My family um, has had roots there for 50 years as kind of a, where we, where we retreat to. And um, Peter, you have a photograph in the book of the Odeon Theater there which uh, is described in the caption as the longest continuously operating theater in Texas. I think it dates back to 1928. And it's, it's a venue I've been to many times. I've never seen a, a film there, uh, but, although there's cinema all the time, but it's a wonderful uh, live performance stage for, for Texas music acts. And um, we did see the horrific arsonists uh, burn down the Mason County Courthouse the four walls and pillars are all that's left. We don't know if the circa 1909 courthouse can be built again, which is certainly de the desire of the uh, townspeople to rebuild it. But uh, uh, an act like that has an extraordinary impact on, on the people that live there and uh, ripples out from there well beyond uh, the town to all of us who care about Texas and, and, and that kind of life and culture in Texas. So, so we want, yeah, you, we were talking a little bit how these columns come about, and frequently they're about the past, but the past could be as recently as last week. And knowing Mason as you two do, I realized that I've got to tell that story. And I talked a few minutes ago, in fact, to 
a couple who, who lived there 30 years. They, they moved there from Dallas because they wanted their kids to grow up in a small town. Brent and, and Monica Hinckley. Uh, and they live on the square. They have a bed and breakfast across the street from the courthouse. Uh, and the, the flames woke them up. And they sat on the balcony of their building with a blanket across both of them and cried watching that building burn. Because, they, you know, they, they realized how much a courthouse, particularly in a small Texas town, means to the community. That, that's the heart of, of, the, of the community. That's where things happen. That's where they have their parades. That's in, in Mason, for example, that's where they have dog parades and old yeller look-alike contests because they're Mason's most famous native son is Fred Gibson who wrote Old Yeller. Wow. Yeah, that's right. It's very, it's, it's a very powerful um, narrative there, what happened. But you know, those small towns, uh, ordinary in, in their own way, mm -hmm. are often uh, the setting for extraordinary events and, um, and extraordinary people come out of those small towns as well. Uh, you know, um, in, in your introductions, you both talk about a maybe a disappearing Texas, but I'm struck by how many of the images and how many of the stories, you could almost have written those 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. You could have almost shown those images 100 years ago, maybe take out a telephone pole or a highway here and there. Um, so much of, of uh, what makes Texas mythic mm -hmm. is still visible. And yet it's also changing. Yeah, and many of us have small town roots. Either we grew up there before moving to the big city, or our parents did, or our grandparents did. And it's interesting when you travel around the state today, there are some small towns that are thriving, particularly if they're within proximity to a metropolitan area. And I'm thinking of hill country towns like Fredericksburg. But there's so many of them. When you drive through, you see empty brick buildings, you know, their show windows are dust covered and there, there are no one's around, there's nobody there and the town is, is just dying. Uh, I, I think we might have learned during this pandemic that there might be a way to save some of those small towns because you don't have to be in Dallas or Houston or San Antonio to work some of the jobs that people have. And some of the buildings in those, those towns, I mean, the empty buildings are absolutely magnificent. Beautiful, beautiful structures that, that you know, I have photographs and I'm, you know, I'm very, very attracted to. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, even one, in the deconstruction, there, there's something haunting and beautiful about them. And you can see that in Peter's photos. There's one photo, Peter, uh, I think it's in Kingsville, a side street and all the historic buildings are either empty or filled with sort of uh, sketchy <laughs> businesses that are in there for the low rent, but you just, right. what would it take to bring that back? Because it's, it ought to be brought back. Right, right. No, I, 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 I love finding those things. And I, each of those buildings immediately kind of springs a narrative when you begin thinking about the history and the people that live there. And the same thing is about, you know, farmhouses that you run into that are on, out on in the country um, that are deserted. That there, there's a story that that you can begin to imagine. And I think one thing that Joe does uh, so well is finding um, these little towns where people have returned or they have made you know wonderful new lives and they have improved the quality of life in these in these towns in terrific ways. Um, I, I... Right. There, there's a process that these small towns go through. Uh, a Walmart moves in somewhere nearby. So the, the local grocery store closes, the local hardware store closes, and pretty soon the town square is empty. Um, sort of the, the last step before emptiness are sort of run-of-the-mill antique or junk shops, right. and then they disappear, and then the town is gone. It, it, it's right. interesting also, Bob, that, that among the, the businesses that seem to continue in these small towns are cafes and small businesses run by immigrants where the whole family works 24 hours a day keeping a Mexican food place going. Right. And there are these wonderful little museums as well, just these local, right. local places that, that you can come to that memorialize the, 
town in, in Sherwood Place. Joe, is the, was the column well established after the first year or so where all you had to do was read your email and, and, and open envelopes and find great <laughs> stories that were being pitched to you by small towns saying, we want to be part of the act? You know, it, 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 they help. Uh, I don't always, I, I can't always rely on my readers, but, but they certainly help. I, I find out things from them that I didn't know. And do you, uh, when you embark geographically into, uh, you know, a distant corner of the state, uh -huh. you end up coming home with the column that you thought you were going to find, or are you often, is there serendipity, or you trip across something else and find out, you know, there's an entirely different story here I want to tell? You know, th that happens. There's an entirely different story. I have to be careful because I'm from Waco, native Texan from Waco, and I know so many Waco stories that I could almost be the Waco Texan, so I have to kind of parcel them out. And here I, I'm sitting in Marathon, Texas, the great metropolis of the Trans-Pecos. I know a lot of stories here, so I have to be careful that I don't become the, the Big Ben Texan. But I, re I remember when you mentioned, was it Peter, you mentioned Turkey, Texas. Right. I was having dinner in Turkey one night at the boarding house or hotel, or whatever you want to describe it there, and uh, started talking to a couple sitting at the next table. And they were telling me these strange stories about uh, the man being bit by a rattlesnake and various other tales I can't quite remember. I had gone there to write about Bob Wills. So after dinner, I got in the car and drove away and got to thinking, that was the column. And so I drove back and sat back down at the table right. and got more detail about that couple. Yeah, and the interesting thing about Turkey, Texas, when we're talking about town squares and they're all going down and empty shop fronts and all that, the entire town square, the last time I was there, was essentially empty. But they had hired some artists to come and do murals of what it looked like in Turkey, Texas, you know, probably in 1927. And, and it, was, it was really quite well done, but you felt like you're here. Yeah. Weird movie set. It was a very strange experience. Yeah. Any close reader of your column, Joe, will notice that some of your best work is done over a meal or a drink that the locals always seem to lure you to dinner, or lunch, or breakfast. <laughs> and but, but Bob, you, you can go into almost any town pre-pandemic, and I hope, I hope post-pandemic shortly, and sit in a Dairy Queen or the local cafe or in Henderson, Texas, for example, there, there's a drugstore where old timers like ourselves gather in a room behind the pharmacy and talk over old times, argue politics, and you can just sit there and listen to them and you come back with, you come up with a story. That, that's one of the reasons that I, I, I photograph in the first place. When I was a kid, um, we moved from New York to California and drove across the country you know, from, you know, every summer from, from uh, Heath, Massachusetts to, uh, to the Bay Area and back. And we would uh, stop in these wonderful little cafes. And I would just sit there, you know, as a kid, as a 12 <laughs> year old, just listening to these conversations. And my, my parents would, would too. And then we'd get in the car and sort of discuss what we had heard. And, and, and I've just continued uh, to do that. I, I love the little cafes and just, you know, sitting there and eavesdropping. Um, and now that I've got hearing aids, you know, it works a lot better. <laughs> and, and, and Bob, the same thing has happened to me. I'm, I'm basically doing not only what Peter is doing, but what I was doing when I was five years old. Growing up in Waco, my dad had a potato chip route. And every day of the week, he would go to different little towns within about a 50 mile radius of Waco. And in the summer and during holidays, I would go with him as his, as his helper. And I began to realize that each of these little towns, whether it's Rosebud or Cameron or Belton, had personalities of their own. And I was curious about if I wasn't lucky enough to live in Waco, what would it be like to live in Cameron? You know, and, uh, and that's what I'm still sort of curious about, what life is like in these small towns, who the, the interesting people are in these, not necessarily the, the, the most prominent people, but just strange and interesting folks in these small Texas towns. You were prompting us from you. I mean, you really were. This is your path was set. <laughs> <laughs> right. You were, um, you know, you're both uh, city folks. Small towns can be insular. How do you win uh, the confidence and welcome of people in a small town who don't know you 
they don't see the Houston Chronicle. Peter, they don't know that you're in the Houston Museum of Modern Art, and I'm not <laughs> sure they I'm not sure they would care if they did know. Uh, and yet, you've got to win the confidence of people and get them to relax around you to have a meaningful uh, experience. I, I have an easy one, and and for most of my work in the in the plains over the years and in the small towns, I've used this uh, wonderful wooden view camera, and it's on a tripod, and you put the hood over your head, and I mean, like Matthew that, Brady. It, it, it's, it's that that thing up and and you draw a crowd i mean and, and then you know, they're, they're wondering i mean kids think that they're going to be on television you know the old codgers you know are telling you you know that they stay you know knew remember these from back in high school and stuff and um it and, and then you can you know begin to say you know or is there somewhere that i ought to photograph around here i mean something that's particularly interesting and oftentimes that will sort of as it happens with joe send me off on kind of wild goose chase and i won't be able to find whatever it is, but there will be an octagonal barn you know, that I've never seen before that, that I, I run into. So for me, I mean, the camera is really uh, interesting. I've also traveled with people too. I mean, when I traveled with Joe, I mean, Joe is just wonderful with, with you know, kind of breaking the ice wherever he goes. Ken Parrick was the same. I mean, I, I traveled all over Eastern Colorado and uh, all over Colorado and Wyoming and, and, you know, that part of the world with him. And he'd grown up in a, in a series of small towns in Colorado and he was very helpful. But I am, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Yankee going out west, come down south. And I, I'm, not, I'm not a native Texan. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, one, you know, there's a certain kind of reaction when somebody pulls a camera out, although Peter disarms them. There's this another kind of reaction when you pull a pen and notebook out and start writing things down. But that, that's true. And, and, and Bob, here's, here's a roundabout way of answering that question. Um, every now and then I get emails from people who say, you know, the only reason I continue subscribing to the Houston Chronicle is the native Texan column. I can't stand those left-wing editorials that the Chronicle runs, and I'm tempted every week to cancel my subscription. Occasionally, I succumb to temptation and say, you know who writes those editorials? <laughs> <laughs> the same guy. And yet, and yet I, can, I think I can break the ice in these small towns because I'm interested in the same things they are, not in their politics. They don't know my politics. They don't know I write those editorials. And I don't particularly know theirs, although the Trump flag out front of their house would suggest who they are. But we're interested in their little town and in the history of that little town and in the people who gather at Orsac's Cafe in Fayetteville every morning, they have a rule that they don't talk politics, but they talk about the town and about each other and, and who's sick or who died or, or who won uh, the baseball game last night. I'm not sure what to say. Go ahead. I, I, I got sort of this wonderful license from my mother who could get a life story out of anybody in, <laughs> in five minutes. And the curiosity was not a bad thing. It was a wonderful thing. And, and anything you're curious about, any question you've got is kosher. And just go ahead and pose it. And, and generally people will warm up. And if you're willing to listen to them, they've got stories to tell. So it's, it's fun. Although it's sometimes, sometimes we do that, that gets you in trouble. I, I was in Galveston one day writing about... Um, a, a little spice shop run um, by a young woman who is related to the Maceo family. Maceo, yeah, right. I know it. And my editor, you know him, Bob, Jeff Cohen, happened to be there with me. And I was sitting there talking to this young woman. She was telling me about the shop, Gallus and History. And, and Jeff says, oh, you're part of that mob family. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the best smelling room in Texas. That little <laughs> spice shop. Isn't it amazing? And then the best, what is, uh, it's a muffaletta. It's just absolutely remarkable. Yeah. Well, never, never agree to take an editor anywhere, Joe. Well, that's the truth, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> You've learned that. Peter, Peter, you talked about your vintage camera. So if there's some photography buffs in the audience this evening, they're going to be interested in that. Is that the only camera you shoot with? And have you had that updated for digital or are you still working with film? No, I'm, I'm, well, it's, I'm not working with film anymore, unfortunately. Um, well, that, it's a, a Deerdorf, Deerdorf uh, 5x7 that I have a 4x5 back for, you know, used on a tripod. And, and that's really been kind of my workhorse over the years. Um, I love my iPhone. There are a good number of photographs in the, in the book uh, that were an iPhone. 
Um, I've used a whole, you know, battery of, of digital cameras, you know, over the years as well, uh, mostly Nikon's. Um, I've got a, a D800 that, that is sort of my kind of equivalent of the of the the four by five camera, um, but it's it's a it's it's a whole mix of of, of cameras. I, I photograph somewhat obsessively with an iPhone, and I absolutely love it. It's just it's fun. It's they, they, it's a good camera. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, that's that's an iPhone picture right there. And it is a gay pride parade um, uh, in Houston, hmm. and it's sharp and clear and inside. And so iPhones five by sevens, four by fives. The books divided the same way all of us divide Texas in our minds, which is east, west, south, north. Um, did you consciously avoid uh, that photo, notwithstanding the big urban areas, and uh, try to keep it small town? Um, was there any sort of uh, method to this, Joe, to where you said that's going to there's going to be an exact equal number of columns geographically uh, for balance, or how did that work? There is a method to it. It's actually five different sections because Texas over the years has flirted with the idea of, of dividing itself into five states. Uh, Cactus Jack Garner, people remember him as, as uh, FDR's vice president, thought it would, would be a great idea because it would give uh, more power in, the, in Congress to Texan types. Instead of two Texas senators, you'd have 10 Texas senators. So, so we took that as sort of a conceit and, and went around in those five sections of Texas. And I, I tried to, to sort of equal out the, the, the number of columns for each section. Do you think you'll uh, ever run out? No, no, no. <laughs> There's just too, too many small towns, too many. And, and I should say that the, it's not all small towns. There are Houston stories, yeah, right. San Antonio stories. One, one for our San Antonio uh, viewers, Bob, one weekday morning, I decided to go through the House of Horrors on Alamo Plaza across from the Alamo. So here's this old guy by himself going through the House of Horrors. Uh, and I got scared, but the, the column had to do with, with Alamo Plaza and what's there now and what shouldn't be there. Joe, I want to call on you to tell one story that may be a little convoluted, but it, it, um, <laughs> it marries two quintessential Texas uh, happenings. One is the assassination of John F. Kennedy, and the other is high school football. Uh -huh. And I have to precede that by saying I was a young reporter in 1979 when I won a job at the Dallas Times-Herald, rest in peace. And um, to my astonishment, 16 years after the assassination of Kennedy, both the Times Herald and the Morning News had full-time reporters whose beat was the Kennedy assassination. Mm -hmm. wow. 16, 17 years later, they were still running down rumors in New Orleans of mafia involvement and chasing conspiracy theaters and traveling around. And both Texas Dallas papers had more money than and they could spend and, and, and the sky was the limit and there was this legendary character, Hugh Ainsworth. And so you, you returned to sit with Hugh many years later. And exactly, right. And, and Hugh is, is one of, the, one of the, the great reporters in Texas, still at work. I think he's 80 something now, but he's still working, still writing books, still reporting. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was telling me that he was off. He worked for the Dallas Morning News, but he was off that day. And he went into the newsroom either to get a paycheck or just to sort of hang out. He didn't have anything else to do. And he realized something horrific had happened. And he raced out there. He didn't have a, a pencil. And so there was a little kid with a, an oversized pencil. And Hugh bought it off the kid's dad and used just scraps of paper for taking notes. And, and as you say, that became his story for weeks and weeks, months and years. At the same time, in Waco, that same day, I was a high school football player. And the state of Texas had to wait to decide, the high school football teams had to, had to decide whether they were going to play that night, whether the, the University Interscholastic League was going to cancel all the games. And the games went on. 
Friday night, the night of the assassination. I played a terrible game. We got beat. A norther came in in the first quarter. I'd throw a pass and the ball would come back in my face. It was a horrific, it was horrible. It was a horrible night. And I remember after the game, it was my last game ever in high school. And I remember crying, you know, just everything sort of fell in on us that night. And so I was trying to capture that from both angles in the column. It was a very moving account. And uh, for those of us that came of age with the Kennedy assassination or the Kennedy assassinations, plural, it was, uh, it was a very telling thing. So I, I enjoyed that very much. Mm -hmm. I want to take a, just a 10 or 15 second break and tell people in the audience that you can join this conversation. You don't need to let me bogart it and ask all the questions of these guys and, and uh, get them telling their stories. And if any of you are from a hometown in Texas anywhere, the chances are they were there and they might uh, be able to share a story of uh, a column or a photograph that's in the book. So you can either post it in the chat room or you can post it in the Q&A. And if you're um, a little bit shy, I don't need to read your name, but if you want your name read, I'll, I'll read it as well. Otherwise, we're, we're just going to continue on. And, and I want to go back to the theme of does the Texas mythic rural um, uh, profile go on indefinitely or does it is it constantly changing forever and I'll I'll just bring up a couple of things in in different parts of the state and ask you to comment on my, the the border and the wall hmm. uh, I remember writing a column a few years ago about a nature preserve in the valley that was on the other side of the wall. It was in Texas, but it was on the other side of the wall. And starting in Brownsville and heading up the river, I kept finding stories about how the wall was intrusive. There were supporters of the wall, but most people living along the border realized that there was a connectedness with their neighbors across the river, despite the problems along the border. And um, that connectedness had to do with sort of the, the Texanness of the, the border area and, and the, the sense that people living over there knew their Texas neighbors and interacted with them. Any comments on, on the, the border wall, uh, Peter, and photographing it or? Well, just, uh, photographing down there, um, you know, I felt threatened a few times, you know, photographing it. Some, sometimes in East Texas, I felt that way. And along the border, I, I was actually cautioned um, by a couple of people that I, I had quite a bit of expensive camera equipment and, and I was really pressing it going, driving, you know, along levees and stuff and um, got followed a couple of times. Um, there was just sort of a, a tension there that I hadn't experienced uh, elsewhere um, in Texas. Uh, but it, it's it's just fascinating area. I'm sure Peter. Yeah. Would. West Texas, Peter. Um, one of the most arresting images, and any of us that have driven out there at night, it's almost disorienting to see the blinking lights. They look like UFOs, but the wind turbines and how much they've changed the view of the landscape. And how how do you look at those as a photographer? It's, I'm really kind of torn. I mean, I certainly believe in wind energy and solar and alternative energies and all that. But one of the, one of the reasons that I began to photograph the high plains and open spaces um, in the first place was that I just loved the experience. I remember coming up over the, you know, the breaks in, in, in post Texas uh, up onto the Isle of Staccato and, and feeling just this exultant, you know, spirit uh, just wash over me and, and hearing music and, and, I mean, this always was what happened. And I, I, I felt kind of a, a wonderful spiritual connection to the space and the land, um, the color, the light, uh, the whole thing. And it was simply because it was just absolutely flat and, and not barren. There were, there, were, there were, you know, all sorts of grasses and things, but it was just utterly beautiful and, you know, untouched by human beings, basically. Um, and first there were the, the cell phone towers and, and they went up. Um, and a photographer friend of mine, Steve Fitch, who had never been able to photograph sunsets because they were simply too, you know, kind of cheesy and, and schmaltzy. 
Um, but if you put a cell phone tower in front of the sunset, you can you can actually do it. And he did a whole series of wonderful photographs of cell phone towers that are that are gorgeous. I mean, the same thing you can do a little bit with with these turbines. Um, but it's just it's it's a it's a visual assault uh, to me. They're they're I mean they march off in their in their rows and um, I, I've tried to photograph them with you know with cattle. You get oil cattle wind turbines and, and cell phone towers all together. And it really it begins to get a little bit cluttered in the, in these, these beautiful wide open spaces. So, I mean, personally, it, it's a, it's, it's, you know, I, I'm not as happy out there as I have been in the past, but I do believe in wind energy. So it's a, it's a, it's a real kind of a toss up. So it's a real windfall for people that are big ranchers. Yeah. There are some very big ranches out there in West yeah. Texas, but did you ever get a sense talking to people about how they felt that wind was a commodity uh, right there in their own backyard. Most of them weren't going to benefit directly from it, but it certainly changed the landscape. Uh, do you ever get a sense of how the average person feels about that? Yeah, it's, it's sort of like Peter said, it's, it's mixed, the feelings are mixed. Until it got dark, I could look out the window here in Marathon and see windmills, old fashioned windmills in backyards, not far from where I'm sitting. I doubt that these wind turbines are going to become iconic Western images the way those, those windmills here in Marathon are. And yet most Texans realize that, that those turbines that say you're at Sweetwater or someplace and see them stretching off for miles and miles, they're the key to the state's future. And uh, I haven't talked to ranchers about how they're dealing with it, but I imagine they have mixed feelings about it as well. Central Texas and Joe, you've been writing about the development in the hill country for years. Uh -huh. um, a couple of things going on there. Um, number one is, uh, you know, you have towns like Mason where the, the economy is ranching on the one hand right. and what they call tourism, which really is lease hunting and, you know, this hunting season they have where they make most of their money. People do come through there. Yeah. You, have, you have towns like Fredericksburg, which has just turned in, there's not a weekend on the calendar where they don't have a festival going on. They're brilliant yeah. marketers. But small, small town Texas, many of them were dry or are still dry. Yeah. So they don't, uh, they don't have the uh, dining and bar destinations for people. Right. And many of them have young people moving away. And many of them... Um, have a, have a per capita number of churches that is very high and fewer and fewer people that are uh, going to organize religion every Sunday. And so I, I wonder how you see the fabric of Central Texas changing over time. Yeah, and, and think of Central Texas in, in a slightly wider radius because I, I'm thinking about the little town of Fayetteville where Peter and I visited and I've been back several times. Fayetteville has spent years it's, it's a little town between Austin and Houston, but nobody really knew about Fayetteville, but it's, it's a neat German Czech community that has maintained its, its historic heritage, houses and, and a, an interesting town square. And yet they realized they needed tourism. They needed people to get off Highway 71 and drive into Fayetteville. And yet they worried about what they called the F word. They didn't want to become Fredericksburg because they felt like Fredericksburg had become so successful, so prosperous, so well-known that it had lost something of its authenticity, whatever that word means. And you, you find the same thing in the Hill Country. Uh, Blanco, for example, is, has been discovered by Austinites and San Antonians, and yet now they're worried that they're having trouble with truck traffic coming through there. Mason near Fredericksburg is a, is a charming community but it doesn't want to become Fredericksburg. And so they have to try to work that balance and it's difficult. I want to ask you about another town that I don't recognize, but it's a question from Sharon Jones out in the audience. Do you both remember visiting Glen Flora, Texas in the resulting <laughs> article? I do, yeah. You're going to have to help some of us, Joe, because I don't know where Glen Flora is. Well, it's, it's close to Houston, Peter. You... It's, it's Wharton. It's yeah, just it's a little kind of a kind of a town outside of Wharton, and, and Sharon Sharon actually was with Joe and me when we were photographing, and, and came up with better photographs than mine. I mean, she's a terrific photographer. She's a fine photographer, but also then Flora is trying to try right. to entice Houstonians out. There's a restaurant, right, Peter? That 
or what was there, it? There, there was, there was, a, there was a restaurant and, and a huge kind of a antique store. Yeah. I think, yeah. It, I think it got wiped out in the flood. I don't know, Sharon could probably help us. Yeah. With that. No, there was a, a, a couple that had, it was really kind of, a, they were coming to the, you know, the king and queen of Glen Flora and doing a pretty good job of it. Yeah. No, and, and, and Bob, that Glen Flora is, is a good example of how there are a lot of small towns around Texas where urbanites have this dream. Let's, let's move to Glen Flora and open a bookstore or a coffee shop. And sometimes they work, sometimes it works, but it's happening all over the state in these small towns. Well, and you're right. If you can get a good internet connection now, you can work just about anywhere right. and, um, and maybe pursue a different lifestyle for yourself and your family and your children and, and still be connected economically to the big city. So that will be an interesting development to watch when we emerge uh, from the pandemic. Yeah. Um, Joe, you you uh, work for a, a newspaper in Houston, and, and Peter, you live there. How much is East Texas changing? And and um, you know, as somebody who knows that part of the state less than I know all the other parts of the state, uh, it also has the highest percentage of uh, black people in its population, rural and and urban. And I've always thought of it as a state that uh, has been the the last to let go of racism and that there have been terrible events in small towns over the years that have made the news. And I just wonder in the, in the world we live in today with Black Lives Matters, with calls for police reform and so forth, if you, how much you see East Texas changing or, or staying unchanged? You know, I think it's changing, but I'm trying to figure out how to say this. It, it, it still has a problem. And this, this is a broad generalization. It still has a problem with, with racial issues. And um, I think one way to perhaps resolve that issue at some point is to tell stories about East Texas that aren't that well known, about East Texas's freedmen's towns, for example, towns established by, by freed slaves, and they're still still remnants of those towns throughout East Texas. And there are wonderful stories over there, not just with, with Black East Texans, but with the, the broader community as well. And um, I don't know, it's, it, it's a fascinating area. And I don't know East Texas as well as I know the rest of the state, but I, my sort of yearly resolution is to, is, to, is to spend more time over there. I remember we went to, to Trinity um, and there's a student of mine, Bill Walterman, who, who lives there. Um, a terrific photographer, and he brings back stories uh, of East Texas uh, all the time. Um, in, a, in a really interesting kind of way, he photographed the little black churches for a long time. Um, but the, you know, it, it's it's, a, it's an area I don't know that well either. I have to say. Yeah, and, and and Peter, you'd probably agree that that a lot of East Texas stories have landed in Houston. I mean, Houston is where you go for for school, for jobs. Right. And, uh, that that's. That Houston is East Texas in a way. Yeah. And yet well, we included Houston in, in our East Texas part of the world. Yet it's become the city that far and away is the most deserve, diverse urban uh, territory in the state with, right. with uh, more languages and peoples and cultures yeah. there than just about everywhere else in the state put together. Right. And, and because it is so diverse and because there are so many newcomers, it, it makes for a good audience for stories about Houston history or, or Texas history as well. What about North Texas? Because I uh, think of North Texas and I think of Dallas, Fort Worth, yeah. the Metroplex. And I think of even uh, communities where my in-laws lived for a while, like Denton, right. that have become suburbs of, of, uh, of Dallas mm -hmm. uh, or Fort Worth and people commuting from those places and that there's just this enormous suburban ring all the way around there that constitutes the metro area. And, and yet I looked at North Texas in the book expecting to see the least and found one small town uh, tableau after another that I didn't recognize or know. <laughs> I, I'm really, I, I'm drawn to North Texas and I, I've done a lot of work on the Anonymous Staccato. And I mean, again, just sort of the, 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 the high plans or something that I, I have, I've devoted a good portion of my life to, but, yeah. but, you know, we, we both ended up in Lipscomb. Lipscomb is on the cover of the book. Um, you have a good story about it. It's uh, there in the, in the introduction. 
That that bank, the Ivanhoe Bank, actually began in Ivanhoe, Oklahoma, and and the railroad went through Follett, and so they moved the entire town across the Red River into Follett, and that building was in Follett for you know, a good 20, 30 years, and, and a woman from Lipscomb um, saw it and fell in love with it and hauled it down to, to Lipscomb, where she's using it as a studio now. So, so the population of Lipscomb is 44, but it's, it's the county seat of Lipscomb County. And the first time I went there, I, I interviewed the county judge and he said, how do you just miss a deer wandering through the courthouse? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Bob, since you, since you don't know North Texas quite as well as you perhaps should, <laughs> you, miss, <laughs> you, you miss the stories like Aurora, Texas, where a UFO allegedly landed or, or collided with a windmill in 1897. Uh, you can't leave us there, Joe. Give us a look. <laughs> <laughs> well, something, something collided with a windmill. And according to the Dallas Morning News, it was a, a, a flying machine. They assumed it was from Mars because there was writing on, on the wreckage that resembled hieroglyphics. And they, they gave the, I, I forgot to tell you, there was a pilot. They gave the pilot a Christian burial. He's, he's buried in the local cemetery. And they threw the wreckage down a well. So people since that, you know, for more than 100 years now, have been searching for evidence of this UFO sighting in Aurora, Texas, near Fort Worth. You, you were not able to advance any of the evidence on that for or against in your own? No, except when I, when I went there, I went into a store looking for someone who had written about the, the UFO incident. And then I, went and he, the, I, was, I learned where the man was. I went back out to my car and a fellow came up to my window and he said, let me tell you a story. And he said he was a retired Fort Worth policeman. He worked at night. He was coming home one night from Fort Worth to Aurora and he happened to see this object that looked like a giant child's top. And it was hovering over a stock tank and it was pulling water up into the object. And then it shot, it, it, it flew away. He went home and told his wife and she said, don't tell anybody else. <laughs> and you're, the, you're the first guy he told. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We had to tell the story. <laughs> Well, it's it's a wonderful book. It's a great read, and it's great visually to go through. and I and I hope that uh, the people on the uh, program today will will find uh, an opportunity to order it. And um, I guess we order everything online these days, and uh, it comes to your door the next morning. So I hope they get it. Where do you uh, let's let's kind of close the program by where where do we go from here? Uh, Joe, what will you be working on? Peter, what will you be working on? Um, I think people will be interested in in how you guys move from project to project and mm -hmm. sometimes closing a project that's been so enormous and, and frankly so successful where you you actually end up with the book. I, mean, I haven't held the book up at all. There yeah, it is. Yeah. There you go. I, I, there's, there's the <laughs> Ivanhoe State Bank there, but uh, how do you move on to what's next? Well, I, I think Peter and I would agree that, that there's more than enough uh, stories and, and <laughs> out there for another book. After after the pandemic, I, I just really want to hit the road. I'm not, I'm going really stir crazy. So, yeah, yeah. well, you have your vaccinations now. Do you feel um, like uh, that's something you'll do? I, I think that's that's a real possibility. Yeah, yeah so. I'm I'm working I'm working on a. I, I began my life um, as a writer, and I was an English major, and all that creative writing. And my first book actually was my writing with photographs along with Denise Levertov, and I did some prose pieces. She did poetry. Um, and I've really kind of relied on writers since then. Um, but about a year ago, I started uh, writing in a, in a kind of subjective way, kind of a little bit of a memoir, a little bit kind of musing on photography and, and time, beginning with a photograph that my father told me to take that I didn't want to take. And it was a photograph that began my interest in, in the high plains. And I came to realize that um, about, you know, three years ago and wanted to do something with that. So I began with that photograph. It led to another photograph that really had to do with my mother and her growing up in China. 
another photograph that had to do with our, our place in Northwestern Massachusetts. And I'm just bouncing around, you know, from image to image, beginning to build a uh, narrative. And it's been the perfect project for pandemic because I'm dealing with my entire archive of work um, and just thinking about it and writing about it. So, and, and you know, um, we have tried very hard here over the now almost complete year that we've been working remotely at the San Antonio Report. We're a, we're a small team of 20 people, but uh, even with all of the social distancing we engage in, telephone interviews, wearing masks all the time, four or five of us have had COVID. Uh, and I, I'm the only older person that's had it on our group. The younger people, um, it, it didn't uh, seem to bother them very much at all, more like the flu. How are you uh, doing your job and staying safe? It's, it's difficult because, it, you, Bob, you as a reporter, and certainly Peter as a photographer, know that, that you, you need to deal with people. You've got to see their faces. You've got to talk to them. And so I, I've been doing a lot of uh, research, you know, uh, delving into history instead of talking to people or talking to people on the phone. Well, um, folks out there in the audience, you can get 20% off uh, Hometown Texas if I can turn a little commercial here on, on behalf of Tom Paxson and Bergen Street and my friends at Trinity University Press, which uh, they do such a wonderful job. Um, there's a promo code called Maverick02, and you can check out, go into the chat room. There's a, uh, a link there. Um, you can get the book there, get 20% off. Um, I'm hoping that still includes the uh, royalty for Peter and Joe and that they don't take the 20% out there. And, and um, next month will be a discussion of the book Marfa Garden, which uh, my citizen scientist uh, butterfly wife has and loves. Uh, it's called The Wonders of the Dry Desert Plains. It's a full color celebration of more than 60 flowering plants of the Chihuahuan Desert. Uh, it's got a, a whole team of authors, Jim Martinez, Mary Lou Saxon, Jim Fissel, and Martha Hughes, and it's moderated by Rainier Judge, and you can also register now for that event. There's a link on that, and you'll get a confirmation email with a, a promo code and an offer to buy the, that book at a special price, too. So thanks for joining us, and, and, and Joe and Peter, whether it's in Houston or Austin or Marathon or San Antonio or Mason, May our paths cross soon and safely. I'd love to get together with you guys and uh, reconnect in person. But it's been a pleasure to be with you for an hour in the, the world of Zoom. Thank you so Thank much, you Bob. Really. Thank you so much. Yeah, good to see you, Peter. Good to see you, Joe. <laughs> Congratulations on the book. Thanks again, Maverick uh, uh, Book Club. Have a good night. Stay safe. We'll see you again soon. And read the San Antonio Report every day. <laughs> uh.